get your setup? Yeah. I'm ready. You gonna face the camera or away from the camera? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Alright. <laughs> now we're recording. On today's episode, we discuss sales. Uh, John is out drafting me and almost forgot to put the uh, microphone on. So let's go. Who are we? Oh, we're the Hardscape Nerds. <laughs> and why Hardscapes? Because we scape so hard. <laughs> John's dressed like a CPA today. I thought we'd talk about sales and pricing, mostly just pricing, not necessarily sales, but um, we touched upon this in the first episode, a little bit about pricing and some of the mistakes we've made in the past. Uh, namely, I said that I, when I would go out and do a retaining wall estimate, I didn't account for the base course of the wall. So that's the first block that's buried below the ground level. Uh, so you can imagine that um, this is the course that, you know, the block itself, depending on the length of the wall, isn't as critical, but the amount of time it takes to install that base course versus all of the upper courses of the wall and not accounting for that, uh, we, we left a lot of money on the table. So, um, I, I would interject and say we left money on the table, but we were struggling to get by. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't simply a uh we just we made less profit it was we made zero profit and we were paying for it uh through a lack of a lack of paying myself wages yep. yeah there was there was a lot of uh a lot of hard times trying to learn this process that's a really good point because it we had grass and other landscape jobs at the time so this is before we focus just on hardscapes and making that profitable and efficient. We were cutting grass, we were um, spreading mulch, um, weed treatments, fertilization at some point, kind of dabbled with aeration um, and dethatching stuff. So what really realistically we had happen was the grass was propping up the hardscapes and we didn't realize it at the time. And like you said, it resulted in not just profit left on the table, but we just we were struggling to pay our bills and, and John wasn't actually pulling a wage. We we thought the the hardscapes, because they were bigger ticket items, we thought that it actually, we were bringing in more revenue. Because if a mulch job was a $2,000 mulch job and a retaining wall was $10,000 retaining wall, we thought we were bringing in you know, five times as much, not really accounting for the fact of there's more materials, there's more equipment, there's more manpower, there's more everything that goes along with hardscapes. So that was that was definitely something, yeah, we had to yep. learn the hard way. We had to learn it the hard way, but we weren't alone because it seems like that's just what people think. Even I've had, I don't know who, there were sales calls that will come in sometimes and people are asking about, you know, what we do and things like that and these salespeople are like, oh, you guys do hardscapes. So you like, there's a lot of money in that. And I think that's where a lot of guys move from maintenance to landscaping to hardscapes because they just see the higher dollars and think there's more money to be made. And there, there's money to be made, but your costs go up exponentially. So, you know, like- if, there's, there's also higher risk. It's true. If you screw up on a mulch job, there's really, if someone, if you have to go back and redo the whole thing, it's you're usually looking at about a day. Um, mm -hmm. If you screw up on a retaining wall, uh, you're probably into it for a week. You know that that definitely adds up very quick. Uh, you don't you don't want callbacks on hardscapes. They're they, that would be a killer. Yeah, 
especially if it's something that happened early on in the process that caused a problem like higher up in the wall and say your, your base settled there's no way to fix that other than to scrap it and start over again yeah. so um, with with the materials and not charging enough for that um, the labor John mentioned that we weren't paying him a wage at all so what happens with that is there are companies where the owner isn't paid and so if they are making enough money to have left over that that they might consider profit at the end of the year if they didn't pay themselves that wage is actually showing up as profit when it really should have been paid to the owner for their work um you know, you're, you're getting a free laborer in as essence a, a volunteer it should be paid as a field worker yeah yeah well that's that's what we did because as a a salary if you give yourself a salary and you're getting paid the same no matter what there the incentive to go out and produce you lose because you're getting paid the same either way i mean if obviously if you're not profitable on the jobs that money's not really there but um for 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 us and, and what we've done with john having him go out and knowing that his wage is tied to being on site and producing in the field that's been huge to make sure that um i mean if you're not if you're not there it's not to say that things couldn't get done or wouldn't be done properly it's but having a hand and being there on site is invaluable you're the one with the most experience and um just you know the right like the way to do things is going to be most efficient just from trial and error over the years yeah and and i yeah i just inevitably i'm going to have more experience than than anybody else we bring on and i keep getting more experience and um you know it's hard to uh for a regular worker to want to kind of do this kind of work for more than a few years and the the wh when they leave the experience leaves with them so yeah it's it's uh that's one really good argument for paying paying well and trying to trying to make it make a company your company our company a, a more of a destination job more of a career path as opposed to simply making it just trying to hire cheap summer help or whatever that you can have a business model that way where you hire college help um, because they don't need as much money um, but <clears throat> you kind of you get what you pay for too so it's it's uh, a little bit harder to continue on with that knowledge you're you're if you're hiring college help you're retraining a new crop every single year and you're only getting a very minimal uh, return on that because it they're only going to last for a few months by nature of it compared to if, if you hire one person they only stick around for one year they're they're gaining you know three months worth of experience uh several times over depending mm -hmm. on your season yeah but by the time you get that summer help up to speed they're back to college that's that's kind of it yeah it seems like it it takes about you know our experience it, ta it takes about a month to really start to understand what we're doing without kind of feeling like you're new and uh and then you, you might get two months of actively participating and but it, it, it's still even though what we do is relatively the same thing over and over again it, it's still a it's a craft and I mean, you look at a bricklayer or plumber. Essentially, they're doing the same thing over and over again. But it, it is a it is a trade, and and you can tell the the guys and girls that have been doing it for for many years. It just they make it look effortless, and that's why they ultimately make more money per hour because they get more done per hour. So, and as a side note, we we have gotten away from hiring for skill, and instead we hire for integrity or like who they are as a person and not uh, what kind of industry knowledge they have 
and it so far it's been working it's a little more of a learning curve for the skill part but we're also not undoing habits that they may have picked up elsewhere that we don't want on our jobs so that's probably a whole other episode right there too yeah um so materials labor and um, equipment costs if you're not accounting for your equipment whether it's owned leased rented uh you're you're cutting yourself short too and and in the past what we had done was we were borrowing a skid steer from a friend and had not built that into any of our estimates so whenever it was time for us to get a machine or rent a machine um you know, we where that money had to come from somewhere. So that was part of the, the struggle. And we weren't used to charging it. And then so when we raised our prices, we started hearing no, because we were competing against guys that were getting a free skid steer or guys that were doing, uh, that didn't really need the money. The guys that were doing, that maybe their, their spouse had a job and they were working on the side. So uh, that, that made it tough initially. Uh, you know, and then we started slowly keep creeping up the prices and, and it, it should have been a, a much more uh, drastic increase instead of us just gradually increasing them. We, we didn't realize how badly we were undercharging and for how long. It's kind of embarrassing how, how long we, we really were just struggling and struggling and struggling and it definitely took Took, took some time to get me on board. I, I wanted to be the, the low cost leader is in, in our market so we could just have a, an abundance of work. But I realized that you, you'll you never be cheap enough uh, to, to have that much work. And it's there's always somebody else who doesn't know their pricing. Uh, the best line I've heard is that there's always somebody willing to go bankrupt on, on that job. They're, they're willing to price it so low that they they lose their their business over over that work and you you just don't want to be one of them uh, so this this time of year for us it's the off season and uh, it's, this is in February and we we this time of year we get a lot of phone calls people looking for uh, looking for work you know pr uh, prospective clients um, that they're looking for prices and we've made the mistake and we just this just comes with with age of running a business um thinking of this time of year when people say no that that dictates the rest of the season the the clients the, the i don't even call them clients because we we almost never get any of these jobs the the prospects this time of year even when we were very I'll say our, we were very low cost, we still got a very low percentage of those jobs. We thought that these people were planners. We thought that as a whole, we, we thought that was kind of the demographic that they're planners, that they're just trying to get it and do their research. What we've found out for us in, in our market for our personal experiences, they're, they're really not that serious. Uh, and a lot of times they don't even get the work done. They're just, people are just kind of inquiring and it's, it, it's never, we've, we've never scheduled an abundance of work this time of year. It's frustrating because we would absolutely love to just be sitting on a mountain of work this time of year. Yeah, to say, oh, we're booked till October. That'd yeah. be great. And that's, that's never, that's never happened with us. And I would caution a lot of the people who are that booked out you're probably not charging enough. So if you're not hearing no uh, pretty frequently, then you're probably not charging enough. We we work it out, I, you know, to where if a person just calls in, we're only we're only going to work with about 10% of, of those people. Yeah. Um, so that's it's pretty low, you know, because we're we're one of the higher higher ticket items in town, and that. Not everybody wants to pay that, but we get a lot of calls from people who had bad experiences with hiring the cheaper guy. Yeah. Um, we've had where we've given 
uh, prices for retaining walls and the the one phrase that sticks out it, and we've heard this several times is how am I supposed to pay that price every year and it's it's mind-boggling that somebody was paying they were paying less money but they were paying every single year to have a retaining wall done mm -hmm. we have projects in the ground that are coming up on 15 years that are still there so how much are you really saving you know so that's that's where that that falls on us as a as a company to to educate about the longevity and uh, Bill Gardaki, he's a uh, an industry hardscaper, one of my hardscape heroes. He uh, says that if your price is too high, then your story is too short. So, and that I would say that's accurate with us that we've not done a great job uh, informing people why our price is what it is and why the guy down the street who's willing to do the job for less than the materials on the job cost alone. <laughs> We've had this happen where someone, our price was maybe $25,000 and someone offered to do it for $5,000. but the 3000 For $3,000. Yeah. And the materials alone cost, cost double that or, mm -hmm. or more than that. So that didn't include permits, that didn't include equipment. That, you know, so how, how on earth was this, was this company going to do it? The answer is they weren't. So they either were gonna back out and never show up hopefully uh hopefully there was no money that changed hands before that or sometimes they take the deposit and then they come tear up the job and then you don't hear from them again and if you if you watch the news uh anyone's local news you you will see these contractor stories happening a lot it, a lot of people don't pay attention to them we do it happens quite a bit we we unfortunately have to deal with the back end the cleanup end mm -hmm. of that and it's it's it doesn't seem fair, um, but it, it's, it's just part of the industry. It, it's a, there's a, a certain requirement that, that falls on the homeowners, too, to, to educate themselves. And unfortunately, they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, as an industry, need to, need to level up here and, and uh, just kind of really help everyone gain this knowledge. I agree. And, and to, that, to your point on that job, Thank goodness our client was savvy enough to know if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And he he's the one who shared that story because he got a price from someone who was doing a wall two doors down. And it wasn't just a, a garden wall. This is a an engineered raised parking structure. structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I, like I kind of want to go back and see what that looks like, but I'm, I'm terrified. No, it's, 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 it is, it's a very scary thought and it's, I'm very passionate about retaining walls because I, I was very close to having a, a retaining wall collapse on me. This happened, I was, uh, I think I was about 20 years old and, you know, back then I was going to live forever. So at the time it didn't phase me whatsoever, but I was, I was cutting grass and these are, uh, in, in a little development outside of Pittsburgh and I was it was a pretty narrow in between the two houses probably about I don't know six feet wide I was pushing the mower in between the two houses I, I just cut the backyard I was pushing the mower I was cutting a little strip in between the two houses came back turned around to go right back to where I was right next to this wall the wall was laying there I was 30 seconds away from being under it and uh Mr. Mr. G came out and he was standing back because they, they had a pole and he was out there and he looked like he's seen a ghost and I said are you okay and he just said I thought you were under there he it was tough to calm him back down because he thought I was under there and and again I, I thought I was going to live forever so it really didn't phase me but now looking back it's absolutely terrifying that I was that close to just being another another uh story you know national news story where you know guy got hit by a retaining wall and uh it's, uh, it's there's a, a lot of those yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot and it's it, it, people don't realize that it just it's patio if you want to screw up your patio and hire the cheapest guy fine just please don't do that with retaining walls and if to uh to any contractor that may happen to listen just please educate yourself um you should absolutely do ncma certifications 
you you definitely need to to really understand the proper procedures have proper equipment have have a have a proper compactor to do it dig back far enough we need at least 12 inches behind the wall minimum we go for like 18 of of clean stone um it just there's a lot of things you can do if you yeah there, there's a the other thing is there's a lot of bad information out there on youtube so if you do need any help feel free to reach out to us we won't charge you we'll just you send us some pictures or something we'll try and help uh as best we can because it's just this is very important to us uh, just for the industry just just to help we want to help people understand it it's really hard to get homeowners on board with why they should do this and why it's important when it feels like a lot of times we're on an island in understanding and trying to emphasize the importance of this. So we, I mean, we looked it up on Howl's before, and these are just people on Howl's. Um, there's, there's a lot more that don't even have a website or a presence that way. But in our market, there are at least 1500 landscaper, hardscaper companies. Again, that doesn't include chuck in a truck. That doesn't include, um, people that aren't even on house, but they're, they're a dime a dozen and it's really hard to talk to a homeowner. And, you know, like you said, our, our story is just too short, but sometimes people have to learn the hard way, unfortunately, that, um, if you take 10 contractors and you put their pricing against each other, you're assuming everybody is doing the same sp scope of work. They all know their numbers. They have a that they they have that business and technical acumen to be able to do it right. So of course you think Susie homeowner, um, okay, this guy's giving me a price of three thousand for a wall. This guy's ten. This guy's fifteen, twenty, and they're all over the map. Well, if everything's considered the same, yeah, I'm gonna go with the cheap guy. Who wouldn't? Because it's all the same, right? Um, but it's not the same as going to Sears and Best Buy and Lowe's and taking a refrigerator and shopping the same make and model to those stores and coming up with the, the cheapest price. In that instance, it 100% makes sense because you know all those specifications are, they're all the same for each product. For this, it's who even knows what you're getting unless you do your own research. So, and even then you have to assume that they're still going to install yours properly. There's a, there's a tremendous level of trust that comes in when, when hiring a contractor, it's, it's absolutely terrifying when you, when you hire somebody and, and we're talking thousands of dollars, you have to trust them. You have to trust that they're going to do exactly what they say they're going to do. You have to trust them. They're going to do the right thing when they're, when you're not looking, because a lot of what, what comes across, we could hide stuff and never bring it up and no one would ever know mm -hmm. uh, when through our excavation process uh when we're when we're digging digging for footers for a wall or or whatever there's a lot of a lot of times we could just cut corners and just slap it up no one would ever know and yeah. it's it's uh it's it's unfortunate but yeah we you have to have integrity and um and, and bring it, bring it. If you're a contractor, bring it up to the homeowners and, and just, you know, share the cost with them. That's how we do it. We, we, uh, if we have to use more materials, we kind of pay the labor and we, we basically ask them to pay for the materials because it's, we, we don't get into a project thinking, okay, let's get them trapped. It's, and then, and then we'll just jack up the price or we don't like raising the price and it, it we're, pretty good at it now to where it almost never happens it's just for something completely unforeseen where mm -hmm. yeah no one no one expected this thing to be here and once yeah. we start moving it it's going to cause this and this and this to happen so yeah that that's and from my understanding that's the way they do it in the uh, home building industry um as I, I checked with somebody i know um who, who confirmed that that's that's kind of how they do it so that's that's where we got that that idea so you know nobody knows we can't pin it on either of us and let's just share it so it seemed the the most fair way to approach it so getting back to actual like the budgeting and pricing projects and stuff like i feel like this is the biggest 
question, um, part of a hardscaper group on Facebook. And that's the biggest question from a lot of the newer guys, you know, how do, how do I budget or how, you know, how do I set my prices? Actually, usually people ask what, what do you charge per square foot for something? And, um, you know, that's not the accurate way to do it, but if you're putting a price together, what would you say the percentages should usually shake out to be like for different aspects? You're asking me? Yeah. You're the one that does the asking. <laughs> Um, but you know all the all the Jim Houston yeah, percentages and numbers. Uh, typically, materials it, it, this this drastically changes. Um, materials are usually around thirty percent. If you're doing a mulch job, if you're doing mowing, if you're doing anything like that, the the materials drop down if you're if you're just mowing there's almost no materials but if for an actual hardscape installation it's usually around 30 percent it can jump up to 50 or 60 percent if you're if you're putting in a, a unilocked fireplace where it's already prefabricated and you're spending a day pouring a footer and a, a quarter of a day putting it in uh in the materials are going to be cost way more than that it, it's just the fireplace itself i think they're between 10 or 12 to like 15 18 thousand depending on what you just two pieces of prefab exactly yeah and, and if there's machine access you can have the guys from the supplier just put it in with their moffet they can install it you don't even need your own really your own equipment um and and but so your labor, if it's, you know, between two, three thousand dollars a day for just labor for your crew, you're looking at what, three to five thousand dollars worth of labor to install fifteen thousand dollars worth of material for that particular. It's day. really skewed. Yeah. So, yeah, that it's so it is all relative. And that's why it's important to actually break down and itemize your your estimates. And uh, you don't have to estimate you don't have to break them down. For homeowners, it's it's more for you to just for a contractor to understand why why the ratios have changed and and uh, that's important. Um, labor is usually they say between twenty and twenty five percent. Our labor is usually towards the higher end because we try and pay our crew very well. Um, that's that's my goal. I, I always uh, make it a mission of mine to try and compete with the unions for for labor. And uh, I don't want I don't want people to come here to have to take a tremendous pay cut. I want them to be able to you know feed their families here. So that, that's the idea there. So we spend a higher percentage on on labor than most. Uh, the flip side is we also usually retain labor like we keep the same people coming back we don't have a high turnover rate where it's like mcdonald's where i think their turnover rate is on average they have to replace that person every three months um we don't test it <laughs> yeah so that's but that's their that's their model they they know that and they understand that they have set up their training you said they'll hire they'll interview five people and maybe keep one of those or something i mean i forget what it is it's yeah so um your overhead costs that includes your cell phone bill your internet bill uh everything that it costs if you have an office if uh you know your vehicle even if you don't have a company issued vehicle you still have to pay yourself for using your own vehicle you should be absolutely tracking that 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 matters because you wouldn't be doing that otherwise if you didn't have this job if you didn't own this company and, and were using your own vehicle you wouldn't have to pay for that so you you have to keep track of that and it's not fair to uh for you to have to pay for that yourself um so there's things like that that that's usually between 20 and 25 percent that depends on on the the company as you grow it becomes a slightly lesser portion uh, of sales and it's usually slightly higher especially like it's higher with design build uh, as opposed to maintenance and then commercial it drops down because 
commercial or usually higher ticket items and they require less oversight. It's usually you talk with one, one property manager and they're giving your crew, if it's a maintenance company, you're getting at least one day of mowing out of that one property manager as opposed to overseeing, you know, normally you can cut like 30 yards in a day with that same crew. So it's one to 30. It's obviously takes more, more uh, management to, to manage 30, 30 uh, individual clients than that one property manager. There's that and also the standards for construction for a commercial project versus a residential project are just different. Like we've talked about this before, you're, you're a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. Normally if we're building it for a homeowner and we order extra block and we're taking the chipped ones away and you know, making sure everything's just so, uh, in a commercial setting, you just, okay, it's chipped, whatever, it's just going up and you're, you're there for speed more so than, um, they're not as worried about the aesthetics. They want it to look, you know, decent, but they're not going to nitpick it. Yeah. You're definitely spending more time on a residential project as you are the, uh, commercial. That's for sure. Um, equipment can vary drastically depending on what kind of business model you use. Uh, it's, it seems like it's around, I think the number is between eight and 13% is, is average. Um, I'd say 10% is pretty good to, to spend on equipment. Now that includes everything that includes fuel, depreciation, um, lease payments, like that, that should be everything that you're shooting insurance for that, for the vehicles. Um, you should really, yeah, pay attention to equipment. That's one thing where I believe a lot of us in the industry really can get into trouble because we love tools and, you know, as a lot of people would say toys, uh, and you, you have to, to really you have to really watch that. Uh, Jim Houston tells a story uh, in his book about equipment where you, if you walk in and you uh, you walk into the back room and you see five guys playing playing cards back there, and it's during during the middle of the work day, and they're just playing cards. And you ask the owner why why are these guys back here playing playing cards. Well, it's in case I need them. Okay, well, are you paying them right now? Well, of course. You're paying them just in case you need them? You know, we would never do that with labor. We would always just send them home. We rent our labor by the means of not hiring that extra guy, um, by sending them home. Um, we, we do that, but for some reason, we're so reluctant to use rentals as part of our our fleet it it it's hard to pay when you're paying ten thousand dollars for a rental when that's close to your payment what a payment would be it's, it's hard to do that the flip side is you don't have to maintain it if something breaks it's not your it's as long as you're not causing actual damage but if you own that machine you you own all of that you own the maintenance you own you own all that you have to buy any tracks you yeah to, yeah oil changes filters yeah you don't have to do any of that and then Usually they, they deliver it to the job for cheaper than you can do it. You can't pick it up in your trailer to drive to their yard, pick it up and get it to the job. You, you can't, usually can't touch their prices for, for delivery. So that's, that's something else to pay attention to. So, uh, and then finally the, the number one thing is profit. You should be making about 10%. Uh, it's, it's, we're big fans of. Uh, Mike Michalowicz books, uh, his, his number one book is Profit First, where it's essentially, it's not really like putting profit above all things, because that was kind of a misconception I had. It's more along the lines of, you just set up a bank account and you just start siphoning off the money so that you don't miss it. You, you move it to a different account so that you end up, well, you'll end up having profit. Otherwise, as business owners, 
we tend to spend everything we have. This comes from, you know, the, the philosophy in the book is, it comes from the clean your plate philosophy that, you know, moms and grandmas have told us for uh, generations that if, if there's food in front of you, you have to finish it all. Well, we're, the, the goal is to use a smaller plate. So, because we will instinctively finish it all. So it's, it's essentially hiding money from ourselves. So that has, that has drastically helped us. So it, and that should be 10%. Uh, that's a good number because you need to get that money uh, as a business owner. The business needs that to cover cash flow issues. Um, and also, if you didn't own this business, you could take that same money and put that in the stock market and you will gain at least 10%. So that's, you have to, you have to think like that. You can't just constantly be giving away uh, and, and just keep buying, buying tools, buying tools and, and justifying it saying, yeah, but I have a bunch of tools that are worth money. They're really not as much, they're not worth as much as you think they are. They're, your, your equipment is worth basically what you can sell it for fast like really fast in two or three days. What is, what is it going to sell it? So what price will it sell for in two or three days? That's really what your equipment's worth. So, and that's a lot less than you probably think in your mind. Well, if it's a specialty item, the market for that is so small that you're going to have trouble. You're not going to command a high price for something like that. It's yeah. 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 So I think that covers everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything that I um, anticipated for today um, there's just so many there's I don't know, there's so much to talk about but only so much time so with that we'll get to Bible verse Proverbs 15 22 without counsel purposes are disappointed but in the multitude of counselors they are established Thank you both for listening. Be sure to share this with your in-laws, your outlaws, that friend who doesn't appreciate personal space. They sure won't bother you anymore. <laughs> <laughs>